And the help for the hurting is the title for today's message. You have your Bibles, if you would open to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. What a tremendous day at First Baptist Church. What a tremendous ministry. Help for hurting people. The truth is, all of us at times in our lives have been hurting or been hurt. And yet, God offers wonderful and marvelous victory. He offers help. And this morning, I want to look at the account where Jesus healed a a, a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. John chapter 5, if you look there in verse number 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. You understand, it is not a necessarily small place having five porches. It is a significant place. In these lay, the Bible says, a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, it put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately, immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed, and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sit no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Lord, I thank you for this service this morning. For the time that we have, for the testimonies, for the music, for the way my heart's already been touched, Lord. But Lord, I pray now that as we look at your word and the healing that you brought to this man and the healing you wish to offer to us, Lord, I pray that hearts would again be touched today. That if someone's listening this morning and they've never trusted you as their Savior, that they would trust you today. Lord, if there's someone who has a habit or addiction or a hurt in their life, would they give it to you and allow you to heal them this morning? Lord, we love you. Guide us and direct us this time in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought it was a fitting passage to come to this passage, help for the hurting, on a day where we can celebrate folks who have been helped in their hurt for healing and for hope. Maybe this morning you heard some of the testimonies and you wondered, well, could I have ever have a testimony like that? Could I ever be like Mr. Josh Bedore and have one year of victory? There are some who would long and hope for one hour or one day of victory, and yet God brings help for the hurting people. Now, the truth is, some people don't accept their need for change. I read about one man who went to the doctor, and and apparently the doctor gave him some bad news. He had some cholesterol problems and some high blood pressure problems, and so the doctor said, you can no longer eat red meat. What a terrible day that would be. So he went, the man promptly went home and stopped putting ketchup on his hamburgers. No more, no more red meat. Well, that's not what we're talking about this morning, is it now? We're talking about help for hurting people. We're talking about real help for real hurts in life. We're not talking about uh, uh, um, knees that are scraped up this morning. We're talking about lives that have been uh, dis, uh, just d- destroyed by choices. Oh, look at this morning, a few points. If you look, first of all, I see the hurting multitude. The Bible tells us that uh, there was a great multitude of impotent folk. There was a whole lot of people around there, and these people were hurting. They were blind, the Bible says. They were halt, and they were withered. Or can we say it this way? They had a whole bunch of problems. 
Not just one type of problem, not just one category. It wasn't just the blind folk here or just the people, the lame who couldn't walk over here. It was a whole bunch of people. And the Bible says a great multitude and they were hurting. And they had a whole bunch of problems. I've been at this church now as pastor less than a year. I'd say it this way, in all my time as pastoring, we've never hit a crisis. I've never hit a crisis quite like COVID-19. Maybe next year there'll be something different. I have been here long enough, though, as an assistant pastor, and along the way that there are people with real problems and real hurt. Every single day, it seems, there's problems. Sometimes it's sickness. Sometimes it's relationship problems. Sometimes in a family. Sometimes outside a family. Sometimes it's financial problems. There's a whole lot of hurt out there. And the Bible says that this pool of Bethesda, there was a whole lot of hurt. I read this story about the former coach of the Indianapolis Colts, Tony Dungy. He coached one of my favorite quarterbacks, and I know by saying this I will now cause division across internet land, but I always appreciated Peyton Manning. There are those who uh, always pitted him against Tom Brady, and so kind of like if you liked one, you couldn't like the other, and I know I now isolate myself from many people, but I appreciated uh, Peyton Manning and his precision and his thought in the game, but that's beside the point. I'm talking about Tony Dungy, who was an excellent coach and coached Peyton Manning. He coached the winning Super Bowl team in 2007, an amazingly successful coach, but also a Christian. In 2006, he told this story. He had recently lost a son. He was talking about another son, his youngest son, Jordan, who had a rare congenital condition, still has it. And it made his son, Jordan, impossible for his son to feel pain. Dungy said it this way, he feels things, but he doesn't get the sensation of pain. And Tony Dungy went on to say that his family had learned many lessons from his son, Jordan. It sounds like it would be a good deal not to be able to feel pain, he said, but it's not. We've learned a lot about pain in the last five years that we've had Jordan. We've learned that some hurts are really necessary for kids. Pain is necessary for kids to find out the difference between what is good and what is harmful. Tony went on to say this, that Jordan, his son, loves cookies. He says cookies are good in Jordan's mind, and if they're good out of the plate, they're even better out of the oven. But he'd actually go to the oven, Tony said, when my wife's not looking, reach and take the rack out, burn his hands, eat the cookies, burn his tongue, and never even feel it. He doesn't know what's bad for him. He has no fear of anything, so we have to constantly watch him. Tony Dungy went on to say a very profound, some profound statements. He said, someone asked us, well, why does the Lord allow pain in your life? You're a Christian. Why do some bad things happen to good people? If God is a God of love, why does he allow these hurtful things to happen? And Tony Dungy replied, we've learned that a lot of times because of that pain, that temporary pain, you learn what's harmful. You learn to fear the right things. Pain sometimes lets us know that we have a condition that needs to be healed. And pain inside lets us know that spiritually we're not quite right and we need to be healed. Sometimes, he said, pain is the only way that will turn us kids back to our Father. Wow, what a profound statement that he made using his own son, Jordan. I can't imagine not feeling pain as, as men were often teased because, you know, ladies do some amazing things and bearing children and us men do as well. I mean, we, we handle big things like, like loads of wood and sometimes, sometimes we stub our toes and it hurts. But I'm not talking about a stub toe this morning. I'm talking about some real hurt. When Jesus showed up at the pool of Bethesda, there were some real people, a whole lot of real people, with some real problems. But I noticed also in this, in this passage, there were some people that were hurting, but there were some people that were hoping. They were waiting, the Bible says, for the moving of the water. And, and what would happen, apparently, and, and we have scholars who have said that this passage is truth on every single level, not just a made-up story. This is true. That an angel would come down one time a year, and the waters would be troubled or stirred up. I don't know if they would begin to move in a circular motion or what would happen, but everyone would know what was happening, that waters were troubled, they were moved. And the first person, the Bible says, that would step down into the water would be healed. Can you imagine 
Can you imagine the fight for the water? They were hoping to get in the water first. It would be worse than any Black Friday sale known to man. I've seen some vicious, some vicious Black Friday events. And, and now I swear off Black Friday. I like Cyber Monday, all right? It's what I like. You can buy the deals. Now, I have been shopping the last few years on Black Friday. I go later on in the day and I get the same deal. It's amazing. What a, what a blessing. But, man, you, you look on the news, people get in fist fights over saving five bucks. Five bucks. Can you imagine the passion they have? And translate that to these people who, if they can just step into the water and step into it, they're healed. Maybe they've never seen anything before, but if they step in the water, their eyes instantly opened. Maybe they're halt and can't walk, but if they get into that water, fall into it, step into it, they're going to walk out, running out there, they're going to walk out healed. Can you imagine the hope? Listen, is it happening today? Is it coming? When is that troubling coming? I can't wait. There's a whole lot of people there who are hurting, but a whole lot of people were hoping. Amen. They were hoping. Amen. We find out later on this man was lonely. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But he said to Jesus, he goes, I have no man. Which tells us that these people who were stood by the pool were not always alone. Maybe they had a son, a daughter, a husband, or a wife, or a, a parent. To say, listen, when this happens, all right, listen, you clear the way, I'm carrying Jimmy. We're getting in that water. You imagine the, the crowd coming together, water begins to trouble, and, and just, you know, dad, clearing the way, people out of the way, fighting for a chance to get healed. Yet we can look around every day of our life and we see people who are fighting for a chance to be healed from some real hurt. Sometimes it's internal hurt and some internal depression. And they say, listen, if I can just conquer this depression, and sometimes they turn to, to beer or to liquor to ease their pain, to find some hope. Yet we know that's a deceitful path and it doesn't bring the healing that it promises. Other people have financial problems. If I can just win the lottery, that'll solve my problems. There's some hope. But we know all of that is fake. It doesn't last. In fact, some recent statistics, people who win the lottery overall end up in a worse spot than they were before. Someone that I knew who knew someone who won the lottery said they made this statement, I wish I had never won the lottery. And yet we think in our minds, and listen, I'm, I'm guilty sometimes driving down the road. You see how much is there. You're like, wow, what I could do with that money. Of course, I'd give to the church, you know that, right? We always say that first. Lord, I'd give you a whole bunch of money. Oh, you'd have a lot of it. 20, 25%, Lord. I mean, Lord, if you want 30%, but let's not push it too far. That'll leave me approximately, oh, $300 million. I'll still be okay. I could, I could survive on an easy 300, on a cool 300 million. You know, and, uh, but boy, hope for hurting people. And, and we see in this passage that there are some hope there. People want an element of hope. But hope... And the wrong thing is deceitful hope. Many are familiar with the Holocaust, where the Jews were sent off to concentration camps. Above the entrance to Auschwitz, the Dachau, there was this phrase in German that said, Works, Work makes free. That work will liberate you and give you freedom. And there was some who actually believed that if they were to work hard in those concentration camps, they would be made free. But it was all a lie, a false hope. I'm here to tell you, friend, that you may think there is hope somewhere else besides Jesus Christ, but that is a false hope. It is a lie. It is deception. You may think you can work hard enough to gain liberation and to gain freedom, but you can't. Jesus is the only one who brings real hope. You see, I see hurting people, but then I see a helpless man. In verse 5, the Bible tells us there was a certain man. It was a distinct man that Jesus went and talked to. I don't know why Jesus chose this particular man to talk to. But the Bible says there was a certain man who had been there with an infirmity for 38 years. Now, I don't know, the Bible is not telling us that he is 38 years old. He could have been 38 and born this way since birth, but he could have been 60 and just had this affliction for 38 years. The Bible tells us that he had an affliction for 38 years. About a month, a few days ago, I turned 40. I know, now I'm old. 
One day, boom, it's over just like that. You folks were so kind and with ice cream and things like that here at First Baptist Church. But I could not help but think when I was studying for this, this man who was afflicted for 38 years, that that was all but two years of my life. It would include all of my life that I can remember. I can remember some things right around a five, and maybe my mom says something I remember is around four. I don't remember anything really beyond that. But all of my memories of my life would still be less time than the time this man was afflicted by this infirmity. 38 years of not walking. 38 years of being afflicted by being lame. 38 years of not being able to pick up his own bed and walk. 38 years of only being able to move if he could drag himself or if someone else could take him there. 38 years. Can I say this this way? It was a distinct man, but I imagine this man was a little bit depressed. What hope did he have? What hope did he have? Because he also was a deserted man. Jesus said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Well, listen, man, l listen, sir, are, are you going to have the healing? And he said, How can I? I have no man. I am here all alone. I've got no one else. Look around, sir. It's like he's saying, Look around. Look, it's only me, and I can't even use my legs. Look at me. I can't do it. I've been here, or I don't know how long you've been there, but I've had this for 38 years. And there are those times that we feel alone that we feel deserted. But Jesus, Jesus came to him. He thought he had no man. He had the Son of Man right there. He had the Son of God who showed up to him. He had a man and he came with a different type of healing. This man wasn't going to toss him in the water. He didn't need the water. He needed the living water. His name was Jesus. Oh, he had a man. He just didn't know what man he had. And that man, Jesus, still comes to each and every one of us today. He says, Wilt thou be made whole. Amen. Won't you be healed? Won't you be helped? Don't feel like you're all alone. You heard testimonies today. Gentleman after gentleman came here and, and God did this in my life. I turned to Jesus and God brought this victory that Jesus changed my life and now I have this and now I have that and, and the one man, now I have a wife and some land. What a blessing. You know, we are not deserted. We are distinct. We may be depressed, but we are not deserted because Jesus is still coming to us today. And lastly, this morning, I see a healing master. I see a healing master. Jesus said to this man who had been afflicted for 38 years, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. What would you say? <laughs> say what? Is this some, some kind of cruel joke? Okay, where are the candid cameras? All right, I know, I know, all right, all right. You're playing some kind of internet prank on me, trying to make this video go viral. Okay, you know, what's going on? Well, what would you say if a man you'd never met before with not any knowledge of what he could do or couldn't do came to you and said, rise, take up thy bed and walk? Would you say, no, no, instead, Jesus, would you just throw me into the water? All right, because that's where the healing is. Missing the fact that Jesus, the creator of the universe, doesn't need any water to heal this man's legs. He said, rise, take up thy bed. Well, what would you do? I'm reminded of a story in the Bible where a man had leprosy. He was commanded to dip into the Jordan River seven times. His first response, if I can loosely paraphrase it, you done lost your mind. That's a dirty river. That doesn't make any sense. You're going to find out that when you come to Jesus, there'll be some things that people will look at you and say, listen, that doesn't make any sense. And they're going to say, hey, you know what? Go to church. How can that help you? What can that do? And yet we know when the master says, rise, take up thy bed and walk, he is the one to be followed. Oh, he's a healing master. He had a command from Jesus. Seemed simple and simply impossible. And without Jesus, it would have been. Because Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. But this man had a choice, like we all do. He could have said, forget you. Send somebody else. Yet, 
What did he do? He stood up, took up his bed, and walked. What did he do? He stood up, took up his bed, and walked. He, he just did the simple thing. There was a command, a choice. And then there was some criticism. Intrigues me about this passage that this man who was afflicted for 38 years, healed, was then criticized. <laughs> Not in amazement, wow, look at that guy walking. I didn't know he could walk. Say, wait a second, sir. You can't walk and carry that bed today. Don't you know it's a Sabbath? Put down your bed. Oh, man. I, I can just, this, this is not in the scripture. I'm just ad libbing right here for a second, okay? But humor me. This guy hasn't walked for 38 years and now he can walk and carry his own bed? This thing was glued to his side. This thing was locked in his arms. He was not throwing this bed down, you kid. Look at me, and I bet he danced a little jig up there. Look, look, my legs are working, all right? It's the Sabbath. I'm dancing for Jesus on the Sabbath. There's some criticism. You see, other will, others will criticize sometimes what God wants to do. They won't see the process. They'll doubt the result. We've had that here at First Baptist Church. Oh, that person, they were addicted to that substance. They can't have real victory. But they don't know about Jesus. A faith-based addictions program, there's no success there. That's true. Without Jesus, there wouldn't be. But because of Jesus, there is. What seems simple and simply impossible without Jesus would have been. 1934. A British magazine told the story of a young prince. And a visit he made to the small hospital where 36 hopelessly injured and disfigured veterans of the First World War were tended. Prince Edward stopped at each cot and shook hands with each veteran and spoke words of encouragement. He was conducted to the exit but observed that he had only met 29 men. At this point, he questioned those who were present. I understand you had 36 patients here. I've only seen 29. The head nurse explained that the other seven were so shockingly disfigured that for the sake of their own feelings and his feelings, he had not been taken to see them. Prince Edward insisted that he would see them. He spoke to each of them and thanked them for their great sacrifice they had made and assured each of them they would never be forgotten. Then he turned to the head nurse and, and said, There are only six men. Where is the seventh? He was informed that no one was allowed to see him. Blind, maimed, dismembered, the most hideously disfigured of them all. And was isolated in a room where he would most likely never leave alive. The nurse said to the prince, please don't ask to see him. But Prince Edward would not be dissuaded. The nurse reluctantly led him into a darkened room. And the royal visitor stood there with white face and drawn lips. Looking down upon once what had been a fine young man, but now was a horror. And tears broke out in his eyes. And Prince Edward bent down and kissed the cheeks of the broken war hero. I don't care how disfigured you may feel that you are. Jesus bends down, kisses our cheeks, and he brings victory. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. John 8.36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The command of Jesus to us, to you and to me, is to believe on him. Our choice is to believe that he died for our sins, that he has the power to save us and to change us. You may be hurt today. You may need healing. Jesus, the healing master, wants to heal you today. Longfellow could take a worthless sheet of paper... Write a poem on it and make it worth $6,000, and they call that genius. John D. Rockefeller could sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth a million dollars. They call that capitalism. Uncle Sam can take gold, stamp an eagle on it, and make it $20. They call that money. A mechanic can take material that's worth $5 and make it worth $50. They call that skill. An artist can fit, take a 50-cent piece of canvas, paint a picture on it, and make it worth $10,000, and they call that art. But only Jesus can take a sinful life and wash it in the blood of Christ, put his spirit inside of it, and make it a blessing and purity and godliness for him, and they call that salvation. Are you withered today? Is your soul withered? Jesus 
wants to bring healing. Lord, I thank you for the time we have in your word. Lord, I thank you for your power that brings healing in lives. Lord, this morning we heard from some men who have been touched in a special way by the Master's hand. Lord, I pray for those who are listening this morning who need a touch from you. I wonder, my friend, if you are hurt, if you need a touch from Jesus, you may be depressed, you may feel deserted, but you're not alone. Just like that man when he said, I have no man, Jesus was right with him. And today I would encourage you to trust Jesus as your Savior. Oh, my friend, it's simple. The Bible says if you admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died for you, and that he rose again, and trust him that you can be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We often help someone pray a simple prayer like this. It's not in the words, it's in the heart. But you can pray it this way. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. My friend, this morning, if you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, would you trust Jesus today? Would you pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died for me. Would you please save me and take me to heaven? I trust him and him alone. So my friend, if you've never trusted Christ, would you pray that today? And if you prayed that and meant that, would you let us know? We'd love to send you a free book, encourage you. Your screen, there's a number you can text or call or email. If you trusted Christ, would you let us know? And my friend is a Christian, maybe you've been struggling today. Jesus still offers help to all of us. Would you bend a knee and bend your heart this morning? for your healing and your power, Lord. I pray for those who listen to the message this morning. If there's one who's not saved or needs some help, that they would turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen.